Welcome everybody. This is Tammy and it's Saturday night. I guess a lot of us are pretty busy. Uh, maybe we're at the club eating dinner and freezing our tails off because it is kind of uh, chilly and windy <laughs> here in Florida. So uh, Nikki Sepsa, he's actually zooming into us uh, from Alabama, but unfortunately we cannot get his camera to work. So we all know that things happen when we try to Zoom, no matter if we practice 24 hours before, five minutes before, it does happen. But uh, I will go ahead while he's talking, I'll go find some photos of him that uh, at least then you can put a, a name to the face. All right, so everybody give a warm welcome and uh, Nikki will start talking. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tammy. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for inviting me to join you here at Glen Eagles down in South Florida, where I wish I was. We just got out of a snowstorm here in Alabama. Uh, we were up to about 60 degrees today, but we were buried under snow the last few days. I want to take you traveling tonight. We're going to look at Asia and the connection between the Asian cuisine. Uh-oh. Who has... Uh, if you, oh, if you, if Malcolm, you like, that was you. Sorry. Now, if you want to mute your devices, uh, what I'll do at the end of the program is we can unmute all your devices and then I'll be happy to answer questions and take comments as, as uh, long as you like. Works a little bit better if you are muted so we don't have any background noise. What we'll be doing is talking about this connection of cooking and culture. Gastronomy is called. A couple of Greek words that I'm familiar with. My parents and grandparents immigrated from Greece and Greeks was my first language. We're talking about gastronomy, we're talking about culinary arts. And you wonder then, well, Nikki, are you a university professor? Are you a culinary expert? Are you a, a celebrated chef? Well, I'm none of those things. Uh, so what are you doing talking to us about culinary arts and gastronomy? Well, all the information that I will be sharing with you is from the work that I've done over the last 38 years as a tour guide and as a speaker on board cruise ships. Now, as such, has given me a chance to visit many of the countries around the world, about 120 of them now that I've been to, to sample some of the culinary traditions that they have, to study their cultures in the way a tour guide would, and then to interview the experts in these fields. When you're not an expert in a field, you go to the experts who are. And that's what I've done is in researching this program and putting it together, I do this many times for different groups and clubs such as yours and on board the cruise ships when we are in Asia. We talk to the people who are experts in these arts. I had the pleasure of living in Singapore for about uh, seven months, so I got to experience a little bit of that, in addition to the visits that we made with the ships and on the tours. Now, as a tour guide, it's been a pleasure to take groups to about 120 countries, visiting many of the man-made wonders of our planet. And then in areas like Antarctica and up in the high Arctic in Greenland, we're looking at sites that are created by hand much greater than that of man. When we are in Africa, we're going to 19,340 feet, taking people to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro or hot air ballooning across the Serengeti. For the times, it's been a pleasure to go to South America. This is the tallest waterfall in the world, 3,212 foot high Angel Falls in Venezuela. Or we're paddling canoes and kayaks on the tributaries of the Amazon, we're trekking down in the southern part of Patagonia, some of the most dramatic scenery in the world. And then the five-day trek on the Inca Trail to the lost city of Machu Picchu. Other times we study the people, the places, and the cooking we find in Asia here, looking at the tallest mountains in the world in the Himalayas, or in Southeast Asia, looking at the Angkor Wat Temple Complex in Cambodia, great Khmer civilization. And then a couple of my favorite places in the world when visiting Australia and New Zealand. We also had some very interesting trips in the Middle East where we are riding camels, tracking Moses across the Sinai and looking at the track of the great World War I hero when we're looking at the different battles that were taking place. Going all the way to Petra in Jordan, went all the way down to Israel and the fortress of Masada overlooking the Dead Sea. Now on the cruise ships, we've been to just about all of the ports in Asia in the Mediterranean, in the Baltic, South America, even river boats there in the Orinoco, the Amazon, and in China on the Yangtze River. Now, as a freelance writer, it's been my pleasure to document many of these adventures and misadventures, like running with the bulls and uh, running from the bulls, as it is in Spain, or jumping off the cliffs in Rio with a hang glider's wings, or walking in the footsteps of the young men 
to change the course of history on June the 6th, 1944, on the beaches of Normandy. So few of them are left today. And then as a writer, I also went from writing different magazine articles to books. I was one of the contributing writers to the Chicken Soup for the Soul series of books. I had a novel set in Greece, 23 of these coffee table books for different cities around the United States, and a couple of commemorative books, the 100th anniversary of the oldest restaurant in Alabama, the Hellenic Heartbeat, our local community in Birmingham. Now, all of these have been exciting for me, none more so than this edible journey we want to take tonight, focusing on gastronomy, which is a sign, again, these two Greek words, gastro, the stomach, and nomia, the study of the relationship of food and culture. Of course, you can go around the world to do that in North America, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, and the islands of Oceania. And the seventh continent, of course, is Antarctica. We're going to focus right there on the blinking one. That is Asia. And look at Asia. You see, you can't do in a 45 or 50 minute, one hour show, the culture and the cooking of Asia. It is just too big. You've got to refine that and get a, a narrow focus. Asia is the largest continent in the world. In addition to being over 17 million square miles, it holds about four and a half billion of the 7.2 billion people on our planet today. That is massive. Look at the flags there. When you're going from the Near East, the Middle East, all the way to Japan and Korea and in the Far East and down to Southeast Asia. All of the different flags of the independent countries that define Asia. Now culinary experts talk about Asian cuisine and they define it as regional cuisine. When you look at Asian cuisine, they're talking about Central Asia or Northern Asia, Eastern, the western part of Asia, southern part of Asia, and then Southeast Asia. All of them interrelated, but all of them very, very different, as you will see. I'm sure you'll be familiar with some of the dishes that we're going to talk about, including the ones that Tammy sent me this morning with the meals that were available for your Asian night. And talk about where some of them came from and how they're so interconnected. Now, to talk about cuisine as being different from gastronomy, Cuisine, of course, the characteristic style of the cooking practices and traditions usually associated with a specific culture. And when you get to Asia, you have so many ethnicities, so many cultures, that you have to tighten your focus to see what we're talking about. In these cultures, they talk about three main categories. This is the first one that we're looking at, Southwest style. Okay, that will include the cuisine that you would find if you were in India or Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and sometimes they include Burma in that, today's Myanmar. And there you find the roots in not only the Arabic from the Arabian boot, but from the cultures and the civilization of ancient Persia. Looking there, you see a lot of naan, the flat bread, the different type of kebabs, whether they're mutton or lamb, curry, and hot peppers and black pepper. This is the heart of what was the, the spice islands here. So you see a lot of that in the Southwest style cooking. When you look at the next one, Northeast style, you'll be talking about China, Korea, and Japan primarily. And there you find the importance of oils, the different types of sauces that are used that you would not find in the Southwest or in the Southeast. We find here food many times associated with religious traditions. It was ancestor worship, for example, in Japan that was a very important part of life that figured into many of their culinary traditions. Looking at one that we're going to look at tonight is the Southeast style. And look at the countries there in Southeast Asia. Looking about 11 or 12 different countries, and they all focus on these aromatic foods. Again, the heart of the Spice Islands, and they took great pride in the stir frying, the steaming, the boiling that they did, using the different basil, the cilantro, and the mint that they found available in that area. And they're big into different fish sauces. We'll show you some of those, along with the use of lemongrass and tamarind. Now, there are many similarities and there are many differences in each of these cultures and these regional cuisine. Curry, for example, we find that in primarily in the Southeast and the Southwest. Now, there are different types of curries in each of those. In the Southeast, for example, they curry is based with coconut milk. In the Southwest, they use more yogurt. We find a staple here that is rice. That's in all three of these regional types of cuisines. Rice is everywhere. We see bread, sometimes flat bread, sometimes leavened bread. It's primarily in the Southwest, so we see so much of this. It's getting closer to the boot of Arabia and to the Persian civilization. 
And then what's pretty much common to most of them are noodles, the different types of noodles that we'll talk about that we find in the Southeast and up in the Northeast. So if you're talking about South Asia or Western Asia, talking about Southeast Asia, talking about Eastern Asia, again, you know, in our presentation, I've chosen to focus on this one, which is East Asia, and this one, Southeast Asia, to show you many of these foods that you probably are familiar with, and some which I feel that you are not familiar with. Let's begin in Japan, as far east as we can go. Out in the North Pacific Ocean is this country with a number of islands there. It's an island with kingdoms. Now it is an independent country, the great capital city of Tokyo. If you visited Japan, I hope you got a chance to go in springtime when it is absolutely mystifying with the colors that you see, the cherry blossoms. They're Mount Fuji, they're framed in cherry blossoms. Just a walk in the park in Japan is wonderful at this time of year. In addition to the great scenery that you see in this park in Tokyo, you have a great variety of food in Japan as well. The culinary attractions. And what are some that you might have witnessed, some that you probably have? Michelin, the French tire people. Back in the 1900, they got into the food business, not in preparing food, but enlisting traveler's guides the early age of the automobile, 1900, 1910, they started listing where you could find fuel and where you could find food. Now, by the 1920s and 30s, what they were doing is rating a number of restaurants. The Michelin rating today is one star, two stars, and then the highest rating they have is the Michelin three-star rating. Now, look at Japan. Of 135 of the three-star worldwide ratings you find, France was leading the way until 2011, the most three Michelin three-star rated restaurants. Well, that went away, and guess who is number one today? Japan. Kind of surprising to a lot of people. You don't think about the highest rated restaurants there in Japan, but they're very proud that last year they were voted the most Michelin starred city in the world, the 226 restaurants that have the stars. 11 of them, and that's unprecedented, are three-star restaurants. Pretty outstanding for them. You start your day in Japan usually with breakfast, and it might be something like this. These are pancakes in Japan. They're not looking like anything that you probably have at the IHOP or other pancake restaurants. These are made with cheese and with shrimp, very popular in their breakfast pancakes. Other times at breakfast at a ryoka in Japan, this is one in Kyoto, would have a sampling of different types of fish, some rice, and some side dishes that might include a number of spicy type foods that you would be sampling. Then if you're having appetizers before your lunch or dinner, it would be called a kaiseki. And here again, it's nearly always some type of fish along with some spices and some of what you will see with these different type of beans that they have. Then comes the items that you're probably very much familiar with, tempura. It can be shrimp tempura, it can be vegetable tempura. This is deep fat fried. Very, very popular, not just in Japan, but around the world. Then we talk a lot about sushi and sashimi. Okay, what is the difference between sushi and sashimi? Is there a difference? Well, there certainly is a difference, very well defined. Sashimi is this. It is the presentation of thinly sliced raw fish or meat. It never comes with any type of a rice. If they send it to you with rice, then send it back. It is not sashimi. Sushi is just the opposite. It is that fish or seafood or some kind of meat that may be wrapped in something. Now here, you can wrap it in seaweed. Very, very popular to wrap it in seaweed. It's always served with rice with, that has vinegar added to it. So it's kind of a spicy dish. Sushi and sashimi. Here's a sample of both of them. Might be delivered to you on a plate in a restaurant where you're having a dinner in Japan. A more elegant would be all of that, the sushi, the sashimi, and then some side dishes to go along with it, many times peanuts and sometimes some wontons. How about this? You're pretty much familiar with, with the kebabs, and here they call it yakitori. Sometimes they'll put a piece of pineapple or something like they have done here, and you can find this in the little vendors on the street or in a very fine restaurant. This is one of my favorites here when I'm looking for some pork cutlets. It's kind of a, a breaded, and it's, it's, a, it's a boneless piece of pork that's a cut. It's called tonkatsu, very popular in Japan. Then if you're a beef eater, they have a couple of big options here. This one on the left with the fried egg and the noodles, 
is called Niku Shoyu Ramen beef. The one on the right is the same type of a beef, but it is over rice, not over noodles. Good choice of what you'd like there. Many times in these restaurants in Japan, you'll have your own little hibachi, either in front of you or in front of the chef that he cooks it for a group. Yakiniku is called over there. Curry is popular here, but it's not the flaming spicy curry that you might think of down in Southeast Asia or in the Southwestern part of the continent. It's a little bit milder curry. And then noodles, many different types of noodles. Here, these are ramen noodles. They also have soba noodles. And this one is called udon noodles. Most of the time, the difference is in the preparation of those noodles, where they're using white flour, buckwheat, farina, what type of flour they're using for the creation of these different types of noodles. Now here is a very controversial dish in Japan. This is whale meat. Very few countries, uh, there's a few in, in the Northern hemisphere when you get them to the Faroe Islands or Iceland and in um, Greenland where they still hunt whales commercially. Japan is the leader in commercial whale hunting and it puts many times whale meat on the menu. Now what kind of whale is being harvested for this meat? Well. Oceanographers tell us that whales belong to an order of creatures called cetaceans. They're the largest creatures in the world. These are baleen whales. These don't have teeth. They have a layer of baleen that hangs from their upper jaw, and that's how they feed. What they're doing is to filter this krill and fish and squid out of the waters. The smaller ones are these what that have teeth, the tooth whales. The largest one is the sperm whale, one of their blunt forehead like Moby Dick. They feed with the teeth that they have. Now the whale that's harvested for presentation at a restaurant is this particular one. It's called a minky whale. It's a smaller cousin of the fin whale. That's about four whales down. Now the minky whale is one of the few that's still hunted commercially. And that's where Japan is under a lot of criticism for continuing the commercial harvesting of whales. But there they have it on the menu in many restaurants. So a full restaurant that you might see is something like this. They'll have tempura. It'll have another dish over here, which is your sashimi, maybe some sushi along with it. And then there probably will be some miso soup and some pickles along with other side dishes, such as rice that are served with that. Vegetable teppanyaki. Okay, there are vegetarians and vegans in Japan, just as there are in other places. So they may like this vegetable teppanyaki. What they're doing here is a variation with eggplant. You have the same thing, spread over rice. It's a kind of teriyaki preparation. You also find tofu, the bean curd. They ever put some vegetable sauce over it. Makes a very nice bit of a dinner here. If you're a vegetarian that eats seafood, they can prepare you a vegetable salad with different types of seafood on it. Sometimes anchovies are a very popular selection. Now, Western cuisine has been introduced. They have a little bread that you see up there and different things in the kaiseku style of a presentation of the typical Japanese dinner. You might have some sushi, some chicken teriyaki, and then for dessert, you might have a little bit of fruit, maybe a bit of a fruit salad. Now, New Year's is when you're celebrating in Japan as they're celebrating around the world. And here they have a number of dishes that they call oseki ryori. These are New Year's dishes. These are very, very elegant and very keenly prepared. This tradition began in Kyoto when Kyoto was one of the ancient capitals of Imperial Japan. It spread throughout the country and around Asia as part of the seasonal holidays. There are five of them that they have in this part of the world. When you see a New Year's dinner prepared for you, you'll see a lot of different items here. This particular one over here is simmered shrimp. You're gonna have maybe some shrimp to start with. And then tazukuri, the dried sardines. I'm not a big fan of that one, but many people are. They put that in the ubiquitous soy sauce. Just about everything over there garnished is garnished with soy sauce. Over here on the right, we're looking at what's called nishimi. These are different types of cooked vegetables. Sometimes there might be some radishes, some celery, different types of vegetables that are cooked. And then over on the far right is kamaboko. This is a fish cake. That's this white one right here. And then it's a very elegant restaurant. They would probably include some of this. Daremaki is a fish paste made into kind of an omelet. And over here in the bottom side, on the left, you see whole sea brim. This is fried whole, even the eyeball is in there. So a lot of people have a little problem with that. 
it's a little bit of a heavy fish for me. I'm not a big fan of that. But there's so many other things, including the star of the show, which many times is the lobster that they have to accompany this vast New Year's dinner that they're having. And many times this is done in the middle of the day. It's presented in souvenir boxes. The lacquer boxes that they have are called juboko. And the juboko box is something that after your dinner, you would take home with you. Everything again seasoned with soy sauce. That's a lot of what we see in Japan. And it's not confined just to Japan. This Kokoro chain is in a number of countries around the world. This particular one is in London, downtown London. You see this same thing in Jakarta, Indonesia. The popularity of the Japanese dishes down in Southeast Asia. Okay, we've been to Japan. Let's cross the Sea of Japan going westward to the Korean Peninsula. Take a look at the food we encounter over there. Like Seoul, the capital of Korea, is just south of the demarcation line where the fighting ended. There was never a peace treaty signed, but as you know, it was just a truce that was signed in 1953. Now, the flag of Korea is interesting, and you see this everywhere. To talk a little bit about that, show you how important they find this flag. Tikakoki is what it's called. And what it is, it came along in 1948. It's one of the newer flags in the world. 1948 is when the Koreans finally finished their occupation with Japan. 1948, it was over. They had their new flag, which was white background, color of nobility. And then in the middle is what they call the Taiguk. This is supposed to be the universe. And that is the universe in harmony. The red and the blue show the perfect harmony, the plus and the minus of the universe. And then what are these things on the side? Trigrams, they're called. There are four of them. Each of them are different in Korea. And they symbolize a number of different things. One is the earth, the moon, the sun, and heaven. Other times it will symbolize the family, the father, the mother, daughter, and the brother. Other times it's elements, the, the earth, the wind, the fire, all the different things that are symbolized here in their flag. If you've been to Seoul, you see what a well-kept secret for many people this visit is. Beautiful city, especially again in the time of their flowers in the spring. Now, we find something here that you don't find in some of the Asian countries is the importance of cattle and beef. They're not so much raising them, they're using them. These are beasts of burden. They were used to plow their fields. So the commoners were not eating much beef. This would be the nobility, as in this painting down here that shows them having a bark of beef. You want to eat your draft animals, so most of the commoner did not. They even celebrated the cow day, part of the Lunar New Year in this part of Asia. And what you find most often in Korea is this, these great barbecues, Korean barbecue. We have some right here in Birmingham, Korean barbecue restaurants. You find them in Korea, there are open air and some are inside for fine dining. And what will you find there? Well, you find usually the hibachi, of this barbecue is done individually or by a chef that's serving maybe a group of people. Different types of meat, you might have some pork, you might have some beef. Jimdok, if you like chicken, this is what you would order here. It's kind of a chicken stew. And then there is kimchi, those different dishes that accompany many of the barbecues. These particular ones you see are salted and, and fermented vegetables like cabbage and some of the Korean radish. Other times you find others that are garlic and ginger based along with jet dog. Now, what is this? Now this is a cause of a lot of people to hesitate and stop. Salted seafood. Sometimes it is presented raw like this, which I'm not a fan of. And other times it will be in a fish sauce, the salted seafood poured over different types of barbecues. Dosa top is very, very popular here. This is nothing more than rice in a clay bowl going in a bowl here, so peanuts and other types of garnish on top of it. A cold noodle dish, you wouldn't make a meal of this, you would start off maybe with an appetizer with konkusu, and then this could make a meal. These are vegetables covered with nut dum uk. It's a bean starch jelly, and that particular one that you see is that, that white one, almost clear, the bean starch jelly. It's called tangpyong chai, very popular dish. This is kind of their version of a mulligan stew. Everything and anything you want to dump into your stew, you do in the Budai Jigu. There's two J's in that one. Very difficult language. They called it army-based stew. At the end of the Korean conflict, 
Many Koreans were starving. They showed up at different army bases to see what kind of leftovers they might get. It was always spam. My father was very familiar with spam. World War II, he was 46 months in the Pacific and he never wanted to look at spam again. But they would have spam, ham, sausage, beans, whatever they were getting rid of, the Koreans were very happy to get and they threw it into this, what they call army-based stew. Still very popular today as one of their mulligan stew creations. This one I have not sampled and I'm not sure I would. Samgyeopsal, what is it? Well, it's one of the more exotic. It is grilled pork belly. The people that I've talked to that have had that swear by it. They like it. You know, tastes are different. Like a Zhang and Banchan is this. Over here on the right, you see crab. And what you see crab presented with a number of side dishes. Next to it are some shrimp. You see some of the noodles. You see some vegetables. All of this in the Gejiang and Banchan dinner. Pretty elegant dinner you have. I'm going to leave now and go from where we were in Japan over to Korea. Now we're going to end up in China. And here we're going to spend a little more time because so many of the dishes that you're familiar with and those that you had tonight were probably original from there. People's Republic of China. Okay, It had been a series of kingdoms and empires. It became the People's Republic of China after World War II ended. And then the fighting between the the Communist Chinese and the Chiang Kai-shek Chinese ended in 1949. Now that is the Chinese flag today, the one big star with the four satellite stars. There are no other stars of any of the 23 different provinces of China. That's the only flag in China. Others by law are not allowed to have their own flag. Now probably more so in China than any of the places that we'll be talking about or seeing, you're going to find the, the food seasoning and cooking with more history and more different ethnicities than anywhere else, not only in Asia, but in the world. People, not only the different ethnic groups that we have and the different historical backgrounds, but they have to use what's available locally for their cooking. For example, down here in the southern part of China, where it's tropical, just a few degrees north of the equator, you've got a much different range of ingredients in we have way up here in the sub-Arctic where it's very, very cold. It's above Mongolia. The great influence of the different Chinese empire. This is the Yuan Empire that was founded. Kublai Khan, the grandson of Genghis Khan in the 13th century. Genghis Khan had the largest empire anywhere in the world. Well, Kublai Khan inherited that and he would expand. We would also see later on the Qing Dynasty and all of the influences from each of these types of dining during those dynastic periods. And then came the European influence. And what was the European influence? This man, Vasco da Gama, in 1498, that's just eight years after the very first European came around the southern tip of Africa. That was Bartholomew Diaz. Vasco da Gama made his trip around the tip and all the way into the Indian Ocean to Indian subcontinent and to Southeast Asia. What he did was open that up in what would be called the Silk and the Spice Road. Here are these cultures, the different dishes are gonna be moving back and forth as the Europeans had a, a thirst now for the treasures of Asia, which was not just the gold and the silver and the silks, but they also wanted the spices, the spice islands here. Any captain who came back from these islands in Southeast Asia with the different spices from the nutmegs, the cloves, cinnamons, peppers, all over this part of the world, is literally worth their weight in gold. Now, the silks from Japan and China, precious stones and dyes from India, all of this from this part of the world to satisfy the diets of the Europeans. Now, the Dutch East India Company would be the one that would lead the way in planting their colonial flag over here. After the Portuguese flag and the Spanish flag was beginning to wane, it would be the Dutch flag in Dutch East India. What was Java is now island here in Indonesia. The routes there were around the Cape of Good Hope, the southern tip of Africa, or the bottom of South America through the Straits of Magellan. So the European influence was big in addition to these great food traditions already in China. What do you have? We have in the west was called the Xuan. Over here in the northern part of China, north central Lulu, south part of the country, the Yu. And then over here in the east was the one that you might be familiar with, Huayang. Talk a little bit about these and how their three regions 
but they have eight different types of cuisines in these regions. You may have heard of some of these. I'm probably sure that you haven't heard of some of them. Of these eight, it would be the Hunan and the Xiaojing that are probably, and the Xi'an that are probably more familiar to you if you have experimented with a lot of Asian food. There are a number of staples in the Chinese diet. Of course, rice we talked about before, it is certainly a staple in China, along with different types of dumpling, mantu it's called, different types of flour that are used to make these different types of dumplings, and this bread, xiaobing. You don't think of making much bread there, but they have some. And then there are different types of noodles, thin noodles, from different types of flour that they use to create this particular product. Seasonings, okay, once again, you're right in the middle of it. And here is one that is probably the most popular of all. If you're in a very good restaurant, they will have what they call wushang fin. It's a five spice powder. And what are the five spices? Well, there are peppercorn, there are cloves, there is cinnamon, there is star anise, and then fennel. Grind all of this up into the wushang fin. Very, very important to their diet. Breakfast many times begins with some of these buns might have a meat stuffing, it might be vegetable, might be some kind of a fish. They're called baozi. Baozi, you might have a little breakfast with that. You would have part of the representation of the Huayang cuisine in this one. This would be a full meal in a restaurant. This is not an experimentation or a, an appetizer. This is a big, big deal. Daishu gansi. What they have here is a chicken soup with shrimp, along with some tofu, maybe chicken or ham or bamboo shoots usually have some peppers that are thrown in there along with it. Sichuan, this is one we're very familiar with. These are different types of stir fries. It might be chicken, it might be some kind of a pork. Lazi Ji, it's called, in the Sichuan type of cooking. And then these clams here are called razor clams. You stir fry these with some black soybeans called bushi, to serve Xiaoding style. You notice the peppers in there. You've seen a lot of peppers now as we move further south. Some of these are not the spiciest, the real napalm type of uh, the heat you up, but they are more spicy than what you see in other places. You probably all had some roast duck, the Peking style duck. And what the chef is doing is preparing the duck with some seasoning like scallions and cucumbers and the sweet bean sauce that he's pasting over that. Also looking here at a popular dish, Sichuan pork. This is a full meal, usually served uh, over rice. Again, you see the many different types of scallions, onions, and peppers that are included in this full restaurant dish. This will look here, what we're looking at. Chinese meatballs. You have different types of meat and seasonings. Here they have some type of peppers you see on the side that would be served with that. This is my all-time favorite. This particular one is shrimp along with vermicelli and garlic. I could eat my weight in these. I just love this one. This particular bit of dumpling that you see here is a zhao zi. And we see a lot of this, not just in this part of China, but all over China and many other parts of Asia as well. The dumplings might have little vegetables or bits of meat or fish in them. All it is is chopped up and then wrapped in dough. Sometimes it's deep fat fried, sometimes it would be boiled. New, Lunar New Year, China, a big, big event. Always a big, this year of course was tempered down with what we had with the COVID protocols. Well, this would be the dish that you would probably have, xiao mein. I mean, people feel that is one of their signature dishes around Lunar New Year. Along with this one, you're probably very familiar with this. This is the sweet and sour, sometimes pork, sometimes chicken. This particular one is new to a lot of people, but it's well worth tasting. What you have here is a bit of crab meat. It's called lion's head. It's a bit of a soup, and you have this meatball soup. Meatball made with crab meat, some spices added to that. This one I've never tried and I'm not sure I ever would. This is a whole perch that's steamed. And they want to make sure that the, that the fish roe, the eggs are included in the fish. Well, it's, it's what you're raised with, what you're used to. I've never had this one. They kind of tone it down a little bit with some ginger and onion. This one, I doubt I would try as well. It just doesn't appeal to me, but the people who have tried it, you will enjoy it very much. Stewed pig's ear. Okay, there's a lot of things that uh, I've tried. I've never tried stewed pig's ear. Are century eggs a century? Are they 100 years old? 
No, of course they're not. They could be months, they could be weeks. It's usually a duck or chicken or quail eggs and they process them in a clay pot using some ash, some salt and some rice hulls. Now, after that is done, the egg of course has turned a different color. The egg yolk, which was once yellow, is a dark green and it has a very sharp flavor. The egg white is now a dark brown. There you see it around a bit of the yolk and it has a very salty flavor. Many times you put that with other dishes. Sometimes a uh, dessert, you'll have just a bit of a, of a pastry here. Sometimes it'll have some filling in it. Other times you would have this. This is the little lemon or egg custard. Now, this wasn't native to Japan. This is one of the dishes that was brought over by the Portuguese. So they're, they're a little infusion into the Chinese cuisine. This is one of those eggs on top of some tofu with a little bit of garnish around it. They're very popular for a dessert. What you had tonight, and this is uh, what many of you had ordered here, and I'm quite jealous of the variety that you had there in your dinner. Look at some of the dim sum, of course. Literally, in the Chinese and the Cantonese, that means touching the heart. And what happened in different tea houses in the province of Canton, you would see people gather for the traditional meal, and they have what they call drink tea meals. That was a dim sum. It's kind of like a tapas bar when you walk into, a, into a, a bar in Spain, a number of different dishes you would sample from each of them. That would be your dim sum. Some of you ordered egg rolls. Of course, what you've got here are different types of vegetables or meats or fish deep fried in this roll here. This is a very safe one that pretty much everyone enjoys, egg rolls. How about dragon shrimp? I don't know if any of you tried dragon shrimp tonight is on the menu. These are different types of shrimp, sometimes head-on shrimp, sometimes they are clean shrimp that have been deep fat fried, usually served with some type of a garnish like some onions or scallions. And here, as you see, and what they just started serving at the restaurants here in town with broccoli, have it with broccoli, dragon shrimp. Surimi crab, well, actually it's not crab. Uh, shrimi crab is what they define as a fish-based paste. It might have some crab, but mostly it's a fish paste. The Japanese call it fish pureed products. And here what you're seeing are little fish sticks. The crab sticks, they're not actually made of crab, they're of this fish-based paste. That's a surimi crab. Wontons, everyone's familiar with them when they boil them, they put them in your soup. If you fry them, they're good with dipping with a little wasabi sauce. And then this particular one is a red oil wonton. This is a full meal here, along with some celery and some scallions, and maybe some rice with that. Edamine, this was on your menu as well. What is this? It's like little furry bits of green beans. It's exactly what that is. The Chinese call it fur peas, maudu, they call it. The Japanese call it stem beans. What it is, is these beans that are immature, they're picked that way, and they're sold that way. If you go to a restaurant sometimes and you just want to drink a beer or in a sidewalk cafe, you might order a plate of these with that. They salt them and they kind of a nice little dish along with your beer. Bok choy. This is in just about all the menus uh, that you saw tonight. It's certainly in the menus all around China. This is a leafy green that is very similar to our uh, greens that we have. We talk about mustard greens, bok choy. Here is the way it looks when it's cooked, and it's usually used as a garnish put over many different types of dishes. You have the bok choy. Mongolian beef was on your menu. Of course, there is Mongolia, there is their flag. The flag is, uh, is recent as well. It was, of course, the Mongolian Empire, the great Mongols who swept across the steppes of Asia and westward. They were part of China for a while. In the 1920s, they were broken off from China, became a Soviet satellite. Today it's an independent country in the United Nations series of countries. And there the Mongolian beef is usually the flank cut, the flank steak. You serve it over rice or noodles, usually with some onions, some scallions, and some peppers that you see thrown in here. Mongolian beef. We're gonna move now southward. We're gonna to go to Thailand, ancient kingdom of Siam. Even though their ancient kingdom, their flag only came about in 1917. And that is when the Kingdom of Siam declared war on the side of the Allies against Germany and the Austro Hungarian Empire. World War II, they never sided with the Allies or with Japan, they remained neutral. Now, much of the history 
of Thailand comes from the people who migrated from China. You see their migration southward from China, bringing with them not just their culture, but also much of the food that they were eating. Here is the ancient kingdom of Siam, and it's the only country here in the Malay Peninsula that was not colonized by the Europeans. We would see the French flag, you'd see the British flag up in Burma and down in uh, the southern part here of Malaysia and all to Singapore, France over in Laos and Cambodia. The kingdom of Siam, and there's this emblem there, was never colonized by the Europeans. It did have an influence from the Europeans on their food. It was called the Columbian Exchange. And what happened was many of the early explorers after the time of Christopher Columbus and the Spaniards and the Portuguese, when they arrived with the products that they found in the new world, they introduced them to the old world. What were they? Well, many types of cashew nuts, peanuts, pineapple, all of these were, were new to the old world. They were brought from the new world. How about this one? This is one of the ancient kingdoms that made up the kingdom of Siam, Ayutthaya. And they had their great little dish here. This is a duck curry. Kang Fet Pet Yang is called it. Very popular dish served in restaurants. And you can get this sometimes also in the food stalls outside. Now, this is another one of the kingdoms, the Sukhothai kingdom, dates from the 14th century. And their great lasting legacy was in carving of vegetables. Now, on the cruise ships, we have some real artists. And that's what they do is use fruits and vegetables and make some really incredible carvings, which date back 600 years. How about Thai salad with these glass noodles? These clear noodles that you see look like glass. Put some prawns with it. Sometimes people put chicken on there. Thai salad. Prawns. Okay, here's where they're they coming with prawns. And these are not the kind of shrimp that we're used to seeing here, smaller shrimp. These are great big shrimp. When I was living in Singapore, I went into a, a restaurant in Bangkok in Thailand. I told them I was very hungry. I said, I'd like to order shrimp. How many come in an, in an order? He said, well, I have usually three or four. I said, hey, I'm hungry. You're going to give me three or four shrimps? Said, if you want more, we will give you more. Well, that's what they gave me. They're as big as small lobster. These are river prawns. These are in brackish and in, and in fresh water, and not the ones that they harvest out in the ocean. And these are big, big fellas. Three or four of those is a meal. How about this? Rice noodles with some type of a chicken or beef or maybe tofu if you're a vegetarian, along with bean sprouts. You've got some peppers in there and maybe a scrambled egg. Very popular. Fat Thai Kung is called. Fat Thai Kung. Salt is when they add something here. What they've got is a uh, a bit of seasoning along with it, and they put some lime here. Sometimes these are very, very tart dishes, and people like to kind of cool it down with some lime. Now, the Thai people are very, very fond of street stalls. They go grazing up and down here. There's miles of these in downtown Bangkok and these other cities as well. You really want a local with you when you're picking out some of these dishes, because unless you're very familiar with it, you're not knowing what you're getting. It might be some that you're very familiar with, some of these satays and others that you don't have a clue what it is. But you can't go wrong. People eat out all the time here. This is freshly made here. This is rice noodles just right out of the blender. They're going to use this in just about all of their dishes. This is one that I have not sampled. I'm not sure that I would because mackerel is what this is. And it's a very heavy, oily fish. This is called short mackerel. They usually cook it whole like that, eyes on and everything. Many times they use uh, a dip for some of the nam kwa prik. This is a fish oil that's boiled down. They put some scallions, some onions, some garlic along with that to either dip your food into it or pour it over whatever main course you might be having. Now, here is where most of the people eat. And they sit on the floor. Even in you visit in their homes, you'd have to be seated on the floor unless they're appealing to Westerners and give you a little chair to sit in. And it was not until recently, or recently me being 80, 90 years ago, when the knife and the fork were introduced over here. Now, most of the places that you see, as in this particular shot here in a temple, people are using forks and spoons. Now we're going to go further down the Malay Peninsula to Malaysia. This is a country that's not only on the Malay Peninsula, it's over here with two of the largest of their provinces on the island of Borneo. So that means you're going to have probably the greatest collection of ethnicities and indigenous people, as you find over here in Sarawak and Sabah on the island of Borneo, to add to the mix of Malaysia. The capital city is Kuala Lumpur, right here in the east. And this is a great ancient land, again, that you find the pagodas, the temples, 
along with a very modern bustling city, Kuala Lumpur. I want to show you a couple of things here that you find when you're visiting those two giant towers there. Each was for a while from the tallest buildings in Asia. The Petronas Tower, 452 meters. And that's way on up there. That's 14, almost 1,500 feet high. Now, it was the tallest building in Malaysia until this one came along that was 40 meters higher. The Exchange 106 building that opened just in 2020. So they're known for their tall buildings. They're known for some incredible food. Now, where their buildings were among the tallest in the world, that's the two of them on the right-hand side, they dwarf compared to what you may have seen if you've been to Dubai with the Burj Khalifa, 828 meters, almost twice as high. Now, their gastronomy is, is influenced by a number of different things here, probably as many as the Chinese. The historical migration, the people moving from the north down all the way to the bottom of the Malay Peninsula, and then the colonization by the Europeans. We would see the Portuguese followed by the Spanish, then the Dutch. When the Spanish and the Portuguese power faded, we would see the Dutch, the French, and the British moving in. And there the flags flew and they brought with them not only their culture, but their food. So you've got all of this making a great mix in Malaysia. The Malay, the Chinese, and the Indians are the three predominant uh, groups there. But when you look at the people on the island of Borneo, and the different types of faces that you see all over Malaysia with that Chinese, the mixture, the European mixture, 42 different ethnic groups. I don't know if there's any place in the world that has that much ethnicity and that much diversity. Many people eat out at the stalls here and they call them a mock. And what this man is doing, kind of a, a bread base, it's kind of a pancake. Now the mortabak is what he's making and you can stuff that with some vegetables, you can put some meat, you can put some type of uh, tofu, whatever you want in there, he can make it in his murtabak. Sambal, this is a chili paste. And here, as we get further and further south in Southeast Asia, you see more and more of these chilies and more of these very hot chilies. Sambal belacan is a little bit warmer one there. They add different things, sometimes some spices and sometimes some shrimp into this. Nasi, nasi lemak could be the traditional dish of Malaysia. What you've got here is some things that you're familiar with and some that you're probably not familiar with. This might be the, the traditional dish for the country. Many times it's served in the morning. I think you could eat this in the morning. What are you eating? Well, it's defined as fragrant rice cooked in coconut milk and a pandan leaf served with anchovies, peanuts, boiled egg, lamb curry, cucumber, cucumber, and sambal. I'm not sure that my stomach can handle that early in the morning. The people ask many times, what is the pandan leaf? Well, it's a very, very popular flower, common in Southeast Asia. They use it for wrapping, they use it for presentation in food, and they use it in seasoning, as you can buy it up here, emerald pandan leaf. The only thing that bothers a lot of people is to have this great, huge, traditional dish for breakfast. If not, you go on through the day with a nasi karabaku. Then what this one is, is adding some chicken on top of that rice, that fragrant rice that they cook, along with spices. Another nasi is this one, the dagan, which puts chicken and a bit of fish on top of there. Nasi dagan. Usually in the fish restaurants, you see something like this. These are different aquariums, and you might walk through like a buffet line and point to the different types of fish that you want served. Many different types. Uh, for dessert, you would certainly try this one. Rujak is kind of a fruit salad. Sometimes you get it in a dish like this in a restaurant. Other times you find the vendors out on the street where you prepare your own little fruit salad. Very, very nice. He has them on ice. Satay, you're familiar with the different types of meat that are roasted here on the, on the skewers. You find them with chicken, you find them with pork, sometimes here presented with cucumber and with onion to make a complete meal. And the very tip of the Malay Peninsula is the island state of Singapore almost the end of our journey now this far south. There is Singapore just across the Johor Straits from Malaysia. And they've got some very interesting sites there along with some very interesting food. It's a beautiful city, it's, it is pristine. Many people feel it is too much so. It's not an Asian city anymore. You could close your eyes and be in Atlanta or Fort Lauderdale or New York or Paris. They do have some interesting things that just opened here called the Helix. In the heart of Singapore, they have a bridge. It's a footbridge. It's called a helix. It's supposed to represent DNA, different colors of the bridge that they rotate the colors, like types of DNA. 
In addition, they have some great Indian dishes. And here this man shows that to properly prepare this type of tea, you've got to pour it from over your head all the way into the bucket. Going into a bird song restaurant. Here they have the bird cages out here. Many Singaporeans like to start their day right here with their teas at a bird song restaurant. These are the people that are known for the hawker center. I'm using center with the R-E as opposed to the E-R because that's the way the British had spelled it. The Singaporeans continue with that. Hawkers, you might be inside like they are here at a stall. You might be outside. This is where the community gathers. They're community dining rooms, and you'll find anything and everything that you want to eat. And most of it is, is the Chinese and Indian influence here in these hawker centers. It might be as simple as a satay that you're having barbecued. It might be a full dinner with some chicken, some noodles, some rice, along with the different spices that you're getting. Now, the largest hawker center, and look how massive that is, right in the heart of downtown Singapore is the Lao Pao Sat Hawker Center. And there you'll see what has just last year became a UNESCO World Heritage. UNESCO is the United Nations Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Anytime some building or bridge or country or city is more important to just the area in which it's located, it will become a UNESCO site. This particular one, this Hawker Center, became a UNESCO representative of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity. All the different cuisines that you find right there at the Hawker Center. One that you find that's very popular is braised pork ribs. You see some fried dough in there, along with a lot of spices, bak kut thai it's called. Then CNN gave a great honor to Singapore. They were included in a 50 most delicious foods, surveyed people from around the world. What are the 50 most delicious foods? Singapore, tiny as it is, had four of them in that list. The highest rated one that came in at number 13 was Hainanese chicken with rice. And this is a dish that originated in the Hainan area of China, very, very popular there in Singapore. The second of the four is this one, chili crab came in at number 29. This is a highly seasoned crab. There you see the peppers, along with the fish sauce that's poured over that. Coming in at number 44 was this one, noodle soup, usually with some prawns, some fish cake. This is kind of gritty. They grind the prawns up there, many of them, and it gives it kind of a gritty taste. Katong laksa is called, very spicy. And at 45 is this one, roti. The roti prada is what is flatbread. It's rolled flatbread like you see right here. Sometimes they'll put an egg or some other type of a garnish inside of it, as you see in that one. And then on the side is a little curry chicken. The last place we want to visit is for what I think is one of the most unique dishes, uh, to give it a, a pass there. Call it unique. We'll be in Vietnam. We'll be in Vietnam. And there we're going to find a fish. This is a common fish among different areas of the world where have coral reefs. This is one you want to stay away from. This is the lionfish. The lionfish has 18 of these tentacles and they have a toxic bit of a, a juice on the end of them. Predators have learned, you leave this guy alone. Divers have learned, do not get near a lionfish. They come up in a trolling net, and even when they're bringing it aboard, they usually use one of these little spears right here, they'll harp the fish and bring it aboard. They brought in and it served as a delicacy. How are you gonna eat something like this with those highly toxic spines? Well, they deep fat fry it. Vietnamese fried lionfish, you might have some with ceviche, depending on how bold and how daring you are. So we've made a long journey from Japan to the peninsula of Korea and into China and then down the Malay Peninsula through Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, and over here to Vietnam. We've encountered a number of dishes. I'm sure some of them you're familiar with. We've encountered a number of people, a number of cultures, and a number of really culinary delights. So I hope this is, uh, we're throwing a lot at you here in the last 50 minutes, and, and certainly you're not going to remember all of this, but hopefully it has triggered a memory for some of you who have traveled in this area, or if you've experienced some of the great food that we've talked about, and some that hopefully you will experience in the future. So with that, I wish you bon appetit and a very, very good evening. Now, if you'd like to unmute your devices, I'll be glad to try to answer any questions that you might have or take any of the comments that you might have. 
I appreciate it, Nikki that I'm like, I don't know where to start. I didn't have dinner yet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I hope that is great. Now you have how many lectures that you can uh, talk to us about? We got 273 as of last count. And um, another one that uh, we had talked about earlier that you might be interested in that I do quite a, a few shows on is in the British Isles from England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. These are foods that uh, might be a little bit more familiar to even some of the things we talked about tonight. And I'm sure that some there that you have not tried. I was living for a while in um, Aberdeen in Scotland. Part of my misspent youth was in Singapore and, 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 and working as a roughneck on oil rigs in the Southeast Asia and up in uh, the North Sea and in the Middle East. So I got a chance to experience some of this and I put together that show on the different types of cuisine in the British Isles. So at a later time, that may be one you're interested in or some of the different uh, special interests or destination focused presentations that I have that hopefully we'll be sharing with you in the near future. I wouldn't mind, uh, I wouldn't mind having him talk about, I love the Taj Mahal. I don't know how many of you love that. The wonders yeah. of the world. We've got the okay. program on the seven wonders of the world, the ancient wonders. We and the Taj that. Mahal came in as one of the new seven wonders. In 2011, they opened up for voting on what people thought should be included in the new seven wonders of the world. So got some great trivia there to ask you what were the old, the ancient seven wonders and what now has been selected to add to the new seven wonders of the world. So I think you'd enjoy that one. All right, well, any, anybody have a question? No, this is Greenberger. I know you always love to ask questions. Come on, somebody, Mr. Zimmerman. I'll stop recording and look, then you guys cannot ask a question. So I stopped the recording.